Last time on our awesome Australian food adventure, we arrived to the island of Tasmania, where we found giant seafood creatures plucked straight from these pristine waters. <laughs> now we're moving away from the sea and heading inland in search of animals that climb, that tree moving, crawl, another one by the guy, and hop. Where is the woolly little shit? Meet Scott, part time insomniac full-time hunter, a man devoted to controlling this island's exploding animal populations. And the reason why I like this show is I like being alone. I'm a loner. Every night when the sun sets, he scours the fields and woodlands in search of prey. Deer, possum, wallaby. Some nights, he bags up to 100 animals. Sonny, I want you to smell that animal and tell me you like the smell of it. Like coffee? Today, Andrew and I are on a mission to learn how this animal harvesting works and why it's so important. With the possum, we've just got an order at the moment that's 3,000 of these that we've got to get in the next month. Plus, we'll have the chance to dine on that wild animal protein. What is the species here? We've described it as the pinot of red meats. Ah, that's a good line. Our story begins with a not-so-typical breakfast. It's not a commonly eaten meat by white Australians, but it was a favourite of Aboriginal Australians. It's also an unusual morning for agricultural scientist John, as he cooks up a mysterious meat for me and Andrew. Quite a dense, fulsome flavoured meat. So what particular protein is John working with today? In the dark of night, this small marsupial, native to Australia, scurries up and down trees in search of its next meal. Its bulbous, shiny eyes are a dead giveaway. This is a Tasmanian possum with a diet consisting of fruit, leaves, flowers, and occasionally small insects. The possum also makes one tasty meal. At least that's what John claims. Right. <laughs> he just gave me the eyes. John, a pleasure to be here. In here, there is possum. It looks like a pulled pork. It's pulled possum. Pulled possum. <laughs> This recipe involves braising the possum meat in water and pork fat for hours. It's seasoned with garlic, cinnamon, salt, clove, thyme, bay leaves, and to truly capture the essence of this land, John adds local pepper berries. Just take a little nibble of that berry. <coughs> oh yeah? <laughs> It's really warm. It really reminds me of like a cinnamon candy that has some kick to it. On the side, a sauce made from apple cider vinegar, brown sugar, Australian rebe berries, and pear. Mmm. What the? Dude, that's amazing. First of all, just the flavors. You can taste the cinnamon and a little bit of the berry. It's super moist. I kept expecting it to taste like a pulled pork, I think just because of the visuals. Wow, it's like better. better than pulled pork. How? It is succulent, incredibly juicy. Right. It's not at all mushy. The texture is quite perfect. That is quite a surprise. Possibly mm. is a very dense meat, so it does mm. need a nice, long, slow braise. This protein, it must be super popular in Tasmania, right? It's not. We don't try to market possum. Our business is all about wallaby. Wearing many hats, John, the agricultural scientist, also serves as the CEO of Lena Game Meats, a company that's been producing A-list game meats harvested from these bountiful lands for the last 30 years. We have a dozen licensed commercial harvesters who are harvesting wild animals to supply us, and they're out every night of the week. What animals are on that list? Bennett's wallaby, brush-tailed possum, fallow deer, rabbits, and hare. In one night, how many animals could a hunter expect to bring in? A good night's 30 to 50 animals. Oh, wow. yeah. Irrigation development across Tasmania and years of good vegetative growth have created an all-you-can-eat buffet for wild animals, leading to a population explosion, especially among wallabies. They are an agricultural problem to farmers. They eat a lot of pasture and a lot of crops. Farmers who face the challenge of crop damage often resort to using poison to protect their yields. Poisoning leads to a painful, slow, cruel death, and it's wasteful. But there's a better solution bringing in full-time professional hunters like Scott. I've got a lot of property from here to Campbelltown, which is trying to do an impact to stop poison, to try to keep the numbers down. And that's what motivates me to actually shoot. And I know when I do it, it's done very humanely. And when you lot eat it, you'll understand, you know, it's a good meal. Yeah, we had some possum. It was delicious. They're oh, terrible yeah. animals. I'll let you eat that. <laughs> you'll understand tonight when we get one. Scott operates as a one-man band, off-road driver, sharpshooter, field dresser, and an artisan of expletives. Let's see where the f***ing possum is, little shithead. Equipped with a hand-operated spotlight to pierce through the darkness, and a rack system in the back meant to pack out his bounty. This is the vehicle right here. It's a little easier to get around on this than oh, a big yeah. truck or something. It's hard to decide that you've got access to everything you need. When the last beam of light fades, Scott takes his cue. 
put the rifles on to go mode. We're moving out. We're just going to look out probably 50, 80 meters. Whichever unfortunate creature crosses our path tonight will be a potential menu item for me and Andrew tomorrow. This, I would think, would be from a completely different animal. Yeah. Basically what we're doing is we want the wind on our nose, which it is, I can feel it in my face. But what we're hunting for, if we're gonna go for deer, I'm gonna be looking for eyes, and Rue will be looking for shape. Sorry. You wanna shoot something? Oh. This here is a wallaby, a distant cousin of the kangaroo, but much smaller in size. They're nocturnal animals, feeding on grasses and leafy plants. Brain shot it. These ones kick like fuck. Up in here. Now we need to bleed it. The kicking business that was just going on, be sure it's shot in the brain. That is just nerves, there is no life in it whatsoever. Now we leave it, we go to the next one. There goes the road. Scott, it seems, was born for this. I um, found another one. Like some kind of wallaby terminator sent back from the future. So we're here with another young business. He operates with pure efficiency. Another one by the guy. Taking aim, shooting, identifying his next target. So what we do now, is we come back, we got this one. Slicing. Straight down. Dumping the guts. Smells like a dirty, I oh, better not say that. Hanging the animal. Now we come back to the one we just got. Then striking again within minutes. Row out in front. That said, even wallaby terminators can have glitches. And periodically, Scott's bullets choose a path of their own. That's a miss. What do you like about this job? What I like about the job is that I'm good at it. And I do love the animals. Don't get me wrong, I'm not shooting because I dislike the animal. I really like the animal. But I know if I do it, I can do it properly. And I know that it's a good death for the animal. Possum, Sonny. Where is a woolly little shit? There he is, little cut. I'll fucking shoot his fucking mother. It seems that Scott and the possum may have a bit of history. Take that, you son of a bitch. As he carefully field dresses the animal, he reveals his side of their rocky relationship. Right, Sonny, I want you to smell that animal and tell me you like the smell of it. Don't get your hands near it because they'll bite you, they'll scratch you, even with their head blown off. I mean, you look at this. Yeah. Very disgusting around the groin. You sure I should give it a sniff? No, I'm saying you sniff this. That's like its armpit right there in its right chest, up. right? What's it smell like? Eucalyptus? Like coffee? <laughs> Medium roast? <rice? laughs> Have a look at the liver on them. I'll give it a cut yeah. for you so you can get your trunk yeah. into that. Oh, nasty thing. What do you reckon? Interesting. Yeah, it has like a old leather couch that's been left in the attic for 15 years that grandma died on kind of smell. Yeah, it is. Well, it's not that bad. No. Oh, that's what I ate today. It was delicious. As the night goes on, unfolding before our eyes is an astonishing abundance of these agile creatures hopping through the fields. As much as I'd be keen to jump in the driver's seat and give Scott's job a go, this type of animal harvesting is highly regulated. Not only must you have proper permits, but hunters here are mandated to land a fatal blow to the brain every single time. We've got a ton of animals here, man. In a typical day, how many are you going to take out? What I was sort of come back with now was probably 30 greys, probably four or five deer, 10 possum, a few forester. I suppose in a typical year, I'd have to shoot 10 to 12,000 of these grey ones and probably 1,000, 1,200 foresters, probably 1,000 deer. And with the possum, we've just got an order at the moment that's 3,000 of these that we've got to get in the next month. So we shoot a lot and we don't ever sort of have any problem getting the animal. And uh, it actually helps everyone really to what we do. Tomorrow we're having dinner at John's place. We're cooking right. up the wallaby and we're hoping you can join us. Yes, I'd love to. All right, let's yeah, do it. Yeah, I, uh, thank you. Uh, Don't worry about it. <laughs> Sunny road shit. Thank you very much. It was great. Soon, these furry creatures will make their way to our dinner table. This is the wallaby wings. Are they really wings? But before they grace our plates, they'll be processed at the Lena Game Meats Factory. This facility can process up to 1,000 animals per week. We have a vision of us producing our food in this land from the animals that belong here. Cattle and sheep had hard hooks. They're not native to this country. They're introduced and farming them. They use a lot of water and they emit methane. Wallabies have soft pads on their feet, which are soft on our soils. They drink almost no water and they emit almost no methane. So from an environmental point of view, producing our meat from them makes a lot more sense.
no part of the animal goes to waste. The fur is treated and transformed into cozy wug boots, while the meat is meticulously portioned, broken down into various cuts. So we have the wallaby right here. Does a wallaby have cuts of meat like a cow does? Absolutely. About 15 different cuts on that animal oh, wow. that we take out of it. What's what it's taken out there now at the moment is just the flat. Main product for that is our mince wallaby. Prime cuts are back here. All in the lower body. So he's taking out here now the eye fillets. Coming out now is the porterhouse. We're boning out the whole leg, taking off the tail and the strip loins which are down in here. So all of that bone product is going into a trolley all over there and gets minced up for pet meat. Mmm, dog food. I could drop you through that mincer hold in one piece if I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we strip on pears. It just looks like a dense piece of lean beef. So this is the wallaby wing. Oh, now I get it. Is it at all similar to a chicken wing? No. Okay, I didn't think so. No, it's 100 times better than a chicken oh, wing. Oh, really? From here, most of the prime cuts are packaged and ready to ship out, while some is processed into savory smoked wallaby or wallaby salami. Right here our very first taste. Should we try out the salami first? It's not a traditional salami. A lot of people would probably call it more like a Devon. Go for it. A Devon? A Devon? A Devon. You don't know what a Devon is. You know, it says food expert under my name, but you can just write that on any software. I didn't actually like get a certificate or anything. Cheers. Wow. That's delicious. Super salty. It tastes fatty. It's cold. It has a nice density to it, but it's not actually fatty, you're saying. No. That's remarkable. It's much smoother than a typical salami. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have that chewiness. It's not aged, I imagine. Oh, and nice and smoky, too. The trim product, you saw the guys taking off the wallabies up there. That's what goes into this. It's really good. Yeah, I can smash that. And this is smoked. Mm. It's all different, obviously, because it's so, not minced up. That's one of the muscles off the legs. Yeah, so a bit different texture. It's really nice. What's the market for the meat? Who's buying this stuff? Now we have our wallaby in 200 supermarkets across Tasmania and Victoria, and over 100 restaurant menus a year. Yeah, it's amazing how much you're able to do with these animals and how you're able to fully utilize them in every possible way. Aren't uh, Uggs like an Australian thing? Yeah, of course. Do guys wear them? Yeah, guys wear Uggs. Right, in Minnesota, it's just uh, it's white chicks. They're comfortable, man. Should be a dude thing. I'm gonna start a trend. Right. Wugs. Next, last night's prey will become tonight's private meal as we head back to John's farmhouse. Andrew? Sonny. How are you liking Tasmania? It's effing stunning. What have I been wasting my time for in Queensland? I'm moving here. Our menu starts with wallaby meat prepared two ways. I have been surprised about the abundance of wild food and just pretty much how good everything's been taste-wise. First up, crumbed wallaby wings brought to life by John's wife, Katrina. In this case, the so-called wings are actually the rather stout wallaby arms, slow roasted for three hours. A blend of breadcrumbs, pepperberry, salt, and rosemary, together with whipped eggs and flour, stand ready for a bold plunge. After being coated, it's time to crisp them up just right. This is very interesting, very unique. These are the wallaby wings. These are the arms, and I'm told they're not used a lot, and so that the meat's softer. Evidently, the less you use your meat, the softer it gets. I think that's true. <laughs> it's very small. It's like a T-Rex arm, basically. Mm. You know what that tastes like? Like rabbit. Really? Yeah. But it's more greasy than rabbit. Yeah, it's greasy, kind of like duck. Yeah, but it has a bit of a wild flavor to it too. Right. And it's got a little funk to it, but it's a good funk. It's like a guy who wears too much cologne, but you're, you hate that you like the smell. Uh-oh, did I reveal something about myself? <laughs> <laughs> the way she's cooked it has made the meat incredibly soft. The texture is a little bit like a duck confit. It's where it's fatty and falling apart. Mm -hmm. But the flavor, there's something else there. A little bit like it's just been eating natural, flavorful herbs and plants its whole life and not just been fed a bunch of grain. The batter here is super flavorful. It has that same local pepper. Oh, I cannot eat 12 of these, that's for sure. With one wallaby dish down, there's one more crop-consuming critter that often ends up in Scott's crosshairs, the deer. Lean venison fillets are salted and seared, sizzling on a thick cast iron flat top. For wallaby round two, the wallaby kebab, seasoned with salt, pepperberry, and local lemon myrtle. Gentlemen, from your firearm through your processing plant to right here on our plate. And the cook. And the cook. Let's not forget that. 
This looks incredible. When you shoot animals, are you allowed to take them home for yourself? Yeah, for me, sell for him. I can't actually give it away or... You can't sell it to someone else? No, I can't. Do you know he's skimming off the top? Well, you must get paid per animal then. Yeah, I do. It's pathetic, but I get it. <laughs> <laughs> right here on the skewer, we have wallaby. Now, Andrew and I have tried the wallaby salami, the smoked wallaby, the wings, but in general, it's hard to tell what the difference is between wallaby and typical old kangaroo. Is there a difference? Uh, a huge difference, Sonny. It's much sweeter flavor and much finer texture than kangaroo. Let's try it out. Let's go. Dude, that is so tender. Mm -hmm. For me, it's a little bit beefy. Beefy. It tastes like a really clean filet mignon with no fat, completely lean, right. but still tender. What do you think? It's good. It does taste like beef, doesn't it? Do you ever prepare wallaby yourself? Yeah, I do. Probably not do what John does. He's got everything smooth and clean. I just rip the legs off, cut the fillets out, throw the front away, give it a bit of a hit. Of all the animals that you hunt, what is your favorite to eat? I'd probably shoot a thousand deer a year and I wouldn't eat 10 grams of it. Wow. So that tells you one thing. For you, is it just overexposure? Yeah. And when you rip their guts out and you see what they eat, and you're thinking to yourself, what the hell would you eat this shit for? I'm not saying it is like that because it's not, but I'm at the real pointy end of it and I see a lot of it. Did I tell you, we almost got a deer last night, but he let it go. He said for a humanitarian reason. Well, I didn't want you to get death. So I wanted to let you know I was going to use the big rifle. I was plugging my ears. Sonny. Not my boss. <laughs> Let's try this deer. This looks fantastic. It's the most tender deer I've ever had in my life. Really? This, I would think, would be from a completely different animal. Yeah, probably a totally different species. So it's fallow deer. What you had in America was probably white tailed deer. That's right. Different species, different meat. Mm. The deer with the pair, it's like fine dining. Coming to the end of this video, we've learned so much about every part of this process. Ideally, as a business, you want demand to go up, but supply can only go up so high to meet that demand because inevitably there's a limited supply of these animals here on the island. So what do you do about that? That's our grand vision, son. Katrina and I are both agricultural scientists and our vision behind this industry is trying to set up an alternate paradigm to meat production in this land. Is it possible to farm wallabies? No, and we don't ever expect anyone to do that. It's just managing a wild population, devoting feed resources and effort to allow it to increase, and as I say, managing it to harvest them for the meat and their skins. Scott, how do you see yourself fitting into this vision, or do you? Yeah, I do. I would say over the last 10, 15 years, we're actually losing the race against wallaby. They're going ahead of us, right. because by having the irrigators, the fertilizer, and the improved pasture. Here in Tasmania now, we've got grass, green grass is high. The roux are not living in the bush where it's very restricted food. The roux coming out to that green grass through the winter and they're coming through really hard. So I can go back and shoot them every day of the week, all year, next year, and the roux is still there and they're still coming through. People like John and Katrina, what they do is fantastic. I just wish there'd be a lot more that jumps on board with what we're doing. But as for me doing it, um, I'm getting soft. I don't want to kill animals anymore. Yeah point you made, which is really fascinating, that I think most people would look at what's happening here on this island and think, oh, humans are interrupting nature. You should just leave all the wallabies and leave all these creatures alone. But what you're saying essentially is because of human activity here, the populations have actually gone up more than they would have if they were left alone. Yeah, that's true. So that is a fascinating perspective and it, it gives it even more kind of justification and purpose behind doing what both of you do. Taking these animals and turning them into something that's not like, well, we can try to salvage it. This is like five star quality fine dining. This is delicious food. So gentlemen, I just want to say thank you to both of you for having us here to see how this process works and allowing us to show at least my audience something that I think few people in the world uh, know or understand. So, thank you. Yeah, Cheers. Thank you very much. It's Cheers. Great. Did you just scoop up water from the river? Yeah. <laughs> Elevate your style with our brand new clothing collection. Rock out in our threads, feel the thrill of culinary adventures, and celebrate with us in style. Head on over to Beffers.shop today. So, gents, so this enjoy. Recipe, where does this recipe come from? Oh, sorry. Enjoy. We're finding our rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. You look out at it, and it looks okay, but there's a lot of rock, shit on the almond stuff on the ground. You can say shit. Can you? Yeah. And Do all animals taste like what they eat? I think a little bit. Even the turtle kind of tastes like... Seaweed. Do I taste like gummy bears? Let's try it out. Mm. Dude, that is so tender. Mm -hmm. Tastes like shit. 
What did you say? Finishing sight. Who is one of them? Tastes like shit. Let's do this properly. It does taste like beef, doesn't it? That's all sorry. I'll do it for you. Goes. Jesus Christ, honey! Come on! You're one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. Boom! Guys, that is the end of the video. I want to say a huge thank you to Andrew right here. You can find him you. on YouTube. His channel is right here, live right now. A series on a Vietnamese ethnic minority known as the... Katu. The Katu people. And much of the series is also food focused. Go to his channel now, take a look, and... Editor, cut. I also want to say a huge thank you to John here for showing me how his company, Lena, works from beginning to end. Not only are they processing and selling meat, but they're actually using the animal hides to make extremely soft, comfortable boots like these Uggs right here. These are Uggs made from wallaby skin. You can find these online on this website or in the description down below. Guys, that is it for this one. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. A peace. peace. Stick around for the bloopers. These are pretty good ones, I think. Tastes like shit.